and the Hardy Saints that want to. Each one's in a different program, and then they're all going to be together. So we're going to go down. We so. have a very interesting speaker today, and I'm going to read the introduction, if you don't mind. Mike Ramsell. Uh, Mike was born and raised in Bear River. On graduation from uh, Utah State University, he was commissioned as an officer in the Military Intelligence Corps. After postgraduate studies at the University of Utah, and the Defense Language Institute, Russian and German, in Washington, D.C. He began his military active duty as an MI. MI. Do, do that again for me, Mike. Military intelligence. Military intelligence. Why didn't you? Counterintelligence officer. Uh, Colonel Ramsdell's career in the Soviet slash, in, excuse me, in the Russian slash Soviet counterintelligence has taken him on missions throughout Europe, Russia, Scandinavia, and Asia. Mike has served with the U.S. and NATO forces, various intelligence agencies, and the U.S. Department of State. His last foreign assignment was in Moscow and Gorky, Russia. Have I pronounced Gorky right? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Mike currently lives in northern Utah with his wife Bonnie and their three cats, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin. <laughs> <laughs> His passion for racquetball, skiing, college football, that sounds great. Mike also serves in Sunday school of his local church. His national bestseller, A Train to Potefka, was Mike's first book. His second book, Potefka's, Potefka's get it right, Martin, Gifts, were released, late, uh, were released last winter. And uh, Mike has uh, brought books and uh, there for your perusal and purchase, right? Correct. Okay. Mike, the audience is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim Reynolds. Um, question, is that you? That uh, is the only picture taken of me when I was a little boy. Okay. The next picture, I was a, a wild teenager. So uh, my brother, one of my brothers discovered that a few years ago in an old shoebox. And uh, my little white Bonnie liked it so much, she said, uh, when you write your next book, that's got to be on the cover. So there I am in all my glory. Uh, I'm honored to be here today, and before I get started, I would like to uh, make special recognition of a gentleman that's in the audience, Dale Quinlan. Dale, will you stand up? Dale is a, a lifelong friend, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dale was one of the pioneers of putting this museum together, the Air Museum. And uh, I think it... Uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude, Dale, for all the work you did your years here at Hill Air Force Base. And he was one of the, uh, on the team that put this whole thing together. And we appreciate that. <laughs> well, uh, as I said, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I hope that the, the few minutes we spend together might be enlightening to you. I've seen several of you at Costco. A few of you on the racquetball court. And uh, as the general said, uh, I grew up uh, in Bear River, Utah. And uh, by a show of hands, how many of you know where Bear River is? That's my alma mater and his alma mater. <laughs> Bear River High School. It's, uh, it's surprising how many people, when I'm done speaking, they come up and say, Mike, I know exactly where you grew up. Our family, we go up there every summer and pick raspberries. Well, they got the bear part right, but there is a difference between the river and the lake. But for those of you who don't know exactly where my hometown is, Bear River is between Brigham City, uh, north of Brigham City, and just south of Tremont. But I have to tell you, I wouldn't trade for anything the opportunity I had of growing up there in that wonderful little community. And uh, I 
all the traveling and places I've lived throughout the world, uh, I still refer to Bear River as home. I still have family there and uh, a lot of friends. Uh, when I left there many, many years ago, there were 300 families. And last week when I was up there to a funeral, there were still 300 families. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a marvelous opportunity to grow up there. And I, was, I grew up the last of a family of 10. And some of you might appreciate this, but I was what we refer to as the 50-year-old mistake. <laughs> My mom and dad had this litter of kids, and then at almost the age 50, this surprise came along. And uh, I was really lost. I have to tell you, I was really lost in my family. Because, uh, for example, I remember Friday afternoon, grade school, walking home to the north end of town, and uh, there would be my family. Some of them would still be there, all the commotion. And uh, I would uh, get my sleeping bag and my dog, make some peanut butter sandwiches, and uh, go upstairs to the attic and get my brother's 22 rifle, abscond some 22 shells out of a drawer, and I would go down to the Bear River. And for us Norwegians that are from that area, we do not call it Bear River, it's Bar River. Another foreign language. But my dog and I, we'd go down to the Bear River, and uh, we'd spend all Friday there, all Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night, all day Sunday, and Sunday night I'd come home. Not one person would know I'd been gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I even write in my book about suffering still today, about an inferiority complex, <laughs> my self-worth. And I really did struggle because it, there was just so much commotion. Being, and I had these four ugly brothers, <laughs> four older ugly brothers. The average age was they were about 16, 17 years older than I. And uh, I was the proverbial soccer ball kicked around all the time by my older brothers. And uh, when you grow up in Bear River Valley. You go to Bear River High School, it is mandatory that you play on the football team. That's just expected of every kid. My problem was when I reported to football, I didn't even weigh 100 pounds. And every night, scrimmaging, practice, I got the dog knocked out of me. And about mid season, I just thought, this is ridiculous. Why am I taking this punishment? I'm not going to handle this any longer. So during one of the breaks we had during the scrimmage to get some water in us, some fluids in us, I told uh, I went and asked the coach if I could see him after practice. And he said, sure, Mike, you can. And uh, so when practice finished, we showered. Uh, my teammates got on the school bus that took them to all those communities and out there in Bear River, Box Elder County, Northern Utah. I stayed behind, and I remember this so well, I'd be so nervous. And I walked up to his office, knocked on the coach's door. I was so nervous. Mike, come on in. And I sat across from him. He was opposite on the other side of the desk. What can I do for you? And I'm just, well, I talked about the weather, and I talked about the next football opponent we were going to play. And finally says, coach says, Mike, really, what are, you, what are you here for? And I said, coach, I've, I've got to tell you, I've got to quit the football team. And he said, well, why exactly do you need to quit? And he said, I said, because you know I'm not playing. I don't even weigh 100 pounds. I'm getting the dog knocked out of me every <laughs> night. I don't even scrimmage, you know, let alone play in the games. And that was a major turning point in my life. And I'm sure that most of you in this room can relate to a similar incident that changed your life. <coughs> because for the first time in my life, I sat across from an adult male. 
And I knew he cared about me. I knew he truly loved me. <clears throat> and he helped me understand, Mike, you are not a quitter. You quit the football team right now. It's Yes, you're not playing. You don't weigh 100 pounds, but you're in your... There's certainly going to be a growth spurt somewhere. He helped me understand that, Mike, your life can be anything you want it to be. And you are not a quitter. That's not part of our vocabulary. We have a work ethic here as a farm boy. You are not a quitter. And besides, who could throw the football better than anybody on the football team but you? And you will get your growth. Now you think about it and let me know if you're going to stay on the team. And I left his office that night. I didn't even walk. I wasn't even walking. I was floating. Because he saw some potential in me. And why I tell you this story is how important it is for us, especially as patriots. The young people, I promise, look up to us. And it's our obligation to help the young people, who I worry about our young people, but they need to understand how blessed they are to live in this great land and the opportunities that they have growing up in America. And as a side note, I did get a growth spurt. By the time I was a senior, I was a monster. I weighed 132 pounds. <laughs> I was a court, starting quarterback on the Bearer State Championship football team and went on to play at Utah State. And people often ask me, how in the world is it possible that a farm boy from Bearer, Utah could end up working in the spy world in Russia? And how that happened, the person to blame, God bless him, is the greatest patriot I've, I've ever met, that I've ever known, my dad, Dewey Algeroy Ramsdale. And imagine this. My dad grew up working in the mines in Park City. And he was supporting his two little sisters and his mother. And he had a second grade education. You talk about a patriot. But in World War I, Dad left, lied about his age, and when he was 14 and a half years old, was serving in the military. 14 and a half years old. After World War I, Dad came home, met this beautiful woman, who eventually became his wife, my mom. And then they left Park City, settled in Bar River City, and that's where they raised this litter of kids. And there, that huge family, when World War II broke out, Dad had paid his dues. But Dad was such a patriot, he left his wife and all of his kids to serve in World War II. You talk about a patriot. And so, to honor our dad, my four older ugly brothers, all stood tall, and served in the military. And when they left, I, and when they were of age and left to serve in the military, and they were all born, born just about one after another, and I was still about five, six, seven years old, well, I too knew that someday I would follow in their footsteps to honor our dad, and I was going to serve in the military. And I remember up there in Barver Valley, hoeing those beets in the summer, and I would see them. I would see those jets flying from Hill Air Force Base on their tra training missions high above Bear River Valley. I'd put my beat hoe down, and I'd look up there, and I'd say, Mike, that's how you're going to serve this great country. You're not going to be a grunt like your four older ugly brothers in the infantry. You are going to wear the Air Force blue. You are going to be an officer in the United States Air Force. So that was my plan, and after I left Bear River High School, I'm at Utah State, and I'm going through the ROTC program, and still I'm committed as to which service I was going to uh, be involved with, but it was going to be, the, no doubt, the Air Force Blue. 
And I go back answering the question, how is it that this cowboy from Berber ended up working in the spa world in Russia? Well, it happened on a particular afternoon my senior year. Because my roommate and I, we had a break from our classes. And my roommate said, Mike, let's go down and see the hot movie of the summer. And I'd heard about it, heard about the main actor. And I said, sure. And so on that fall afternoon, we went downtown Logan, sat in the seats, and this will date me. And there on the movie screen, we saw the second 007, the second James Bond movie ever filmed, entitled For Russia With Love. And I was totally mesmerized. I was... I really didn't understand what a covert agent was. I wasn't a reader. You know, my priorities in school and high school and college were sports and athletics and girls, mostly girls. But I didn't really have an understanding of, of the covert world, the, the people working in intelligence. But that afternoon in that movie theater, I was just absolutely blown away by all the suspense, the spy paraphernalia, all the intrigue, the fast cars, especially the beautiful babes. <laughs> and what I couldn't believe, ladies and gentlemen, was how much I looked like Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> and I told my roommate, that is how I'm going to serve this great country. And by month's end, I had made the commitment, and a couple of months later, I was commissioned into military intelligence. But I have to admit, I was not a top student in school, in college. I was a mediocre student. So how did I get into the program? Because I already spoke four languages. Obviously, I spoke English. And then I had served a mission for my church. And I'd served my mission in Europe. And half of my mission, I served in Germany, so I spoke German. The other half of my mission, I served in Switzerland, so I spoke Switzerdeutsch. And then the other fourth language I speak is that language that we still speak up there today in Barber. <laughs> and I had my foot in the door, was accepted into the program, and what a great experience it was to serve with those noble young men and women. And I want to, I want to sort of do a timeout here and tell you and congratulate you and have you realize again, which I'm sure all of you know, that how proud you should be of the young men and women that come from this area of the country. And I'm not talking about just here in Utah, but the, from Colorado West, north to the Washington border of Canada, Arizona, California. Because ladies and gentlemen, and again, most of you in this room know this, that within the umbrella of the United States government, we have 15 intelligence agencies. The CIA, the FBI, DIA, and it goes on and on. And each, as you remember, Navy has their own intelligence service, Air Force does, Army does. But there's 15 agencies within the umbrella of the federal government. And the number one place for our agencies to recruit back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the Ivy League schools where all the brains were. And then about in the middle, mid-60s, the federal government realized what a resource they have here in this Intermountain area. There's this particular organization that sends these young men and women out in the world. And they're out there for two, two and a half years. They come back and they're completely fluent in another language. They've lived in that foreign country. They understand its culture, its people. And what a resource that is for these intelligence agencies to recruit. I'm sure that some of you in this room have sons and daughters at the University of Utah, BYU, at Utah State, at Weber, during recruiting week. And those agencies are there recruiting. And for you young people, I'm not a recruiter, but I do have an application for you. <laughs> <laughs> but today, ladies and gentlemen, the number one place 
for those 15 intelligence agencies to recruit is Malad, Idaho. That was a joke. <laughs> but how proud you should be, the legacy. I mean, so I'm interviewing a new young guy, doing interviews who wants to be part of one of the agencies, or our particular agency. And he's just returned from Moscow, Russia, speaks the language fluently, understands the culture, the people, not sure about Putin. <laughs> and is he a patriot? Are our young people patriots? Absolutely. The legacy we leave our young people, they love this country. And I put a star on his forehead and tell him to wait in the foyer. And then in comes the dude from Harvard. And the first question we ask them, and maybe some of you except for this interview, the first question we ask them, have you ever in your life messed around with hard drugs? Mr. Ramsdell, absolutely not. Never have I messed around with hard drugs except for one. Excuse me? I have never messed around with drugs except just that one time. Would you like to expand what you what you were referring? Well, it was graduation, and Joe and I thought we would go, you know, uh, do some drugs, and uh, so it was only one time. Well, actually, Mr. Ramsdale, it was the whole weekend. Uh, it was the whole week. Mr. Ramsdale, it was the whole summer. And ladies and gentlemen, the interview is over. Because someday we're going to be asking that young man or that young woman to deal with people's lives, working in intelligence, deal with people's lives, top secret information, national security information. Could we take the risk of that young man or young woman having that in their background? Because the adversary, as good as they are, as good as the North Koreans could be, as good as the Israelis are, even our friends, they would have a dossier about their background. We could not take the risk. So the, the few things that I leave with you today, because I'm going to challenge you, that we mean so much to our young people. And our young people, our sons and daughters, our <coughs> grandchildren, take the opportunity to sit down with them when the opportunity is right and tell them. Give, tell them to let themselves, give themselves a chance. If he wants to be the no football coach to, rep, to replace Anderson at Utah State, so be it. If he wants to replace Senator Hatch, or Senator Hatch is going to be there forever, that's right. <laughs> or if he wants to be the next 007, give himself a chance. You know, give yourself a chance. Don't ever mess around with that evil of, of drugs. Thank God I can say that, I mean, growing up there in Barber, I mean, the, the horrible, <coughs> absolute horrible kids, they'd go out and have a Budweiser. That was, their, that was drugs back then. And what our young people face today? Wow. Now, I want to tell you that and again, what a, what a marvelous opportunity I had of serving in, in the covert world. And the career break, and I, I was not 007, uh, even though there's been 23 007 movies made, I, I cannot go to them because they are so bizarre, so ridiculous. Those of you who've worked in intelligence know what I'm talking about. I mean... They are so unreal. And why are they made the way they are? The movie producers, they're after one thing. Dengue. Money. And so there's the car chase, the gun battle, the bedroom scene. Another car chase, a gun battle. And after two hours, you're just completely exhausted. But it's not really how the spy world, the covert world, really functions. And the career break that I had, ladies and gentlemen, was, and most of you in this room, will remember this, is years ago, and this did happen years ago, but when it, the Soviet Union was still under communism, we 
had outgrown, we, the United States of America, we'd outgrown our embassy in Moscow, Russia. We needed a new embassy. We had the capacity for 800 foreign service workers to work there. We had 1,800 people working there. We had, if that's the KGB, I'm not here. <laughs> we had 1,800 people working at our embassy. We had secretaries in the hallway, diplomats in the commode. We had no space. We needed a new embassy. And at the very same time, the communist Soviet government in Washington, D.C. had outgrown their embassy. And because of the mistrust our countries had one for another, it took 10 years to negotiate a memorandum of understanding for our two countries to build new embassies. <coughs> now stay with me on this. On a particular day, the Soviet communist government started building their new embassy in Washington, D.C. On the very same day, the Soviet communist government started building our new embassy in <coughs> Moscow, Russia. <laughs> Can you imagine our Sovietologists, our State Department people, would be so dumb to allow the Soviets, the KGB, the Communists, all the trouble we had with them, the mistrust we had for them, we would allow them. 805 Soviet workers for four years had a major role in building our new embassy. How many of you have been to Russia? All right. A few of us. Then, and those of the, you're going, you got to put that on your bucket list. And the way Putin's doing things, I would, I would do this soon. But historically, and even today, the Russians build their buildings modularly. So off the compound, the U.S. compound site where we're building the embassy, they would, they would pour the concrete floors, the walls, and the ceilings, and put all the wiring and listening devices. Then they paint over and putty over and the wallpaper over, and then they would take these huge concrete forms to the American Embassy job site and put together this $400 million tinker toy. Hmm. Five years into, excuse me, four years into construction, that one guy at the State Department with some something up here decided, you know, we ought to take our high-tech people and their high-tech equipment to Moscow and check out our new embassy. And they did. And what did they find? Bugs. Tens of thousands of bugs. Our embassy was compromised. We could not use it. Actually, that's not true. We were able to use the basketball court and the swimming pool. And doesn't this sound like a politician? And my apologies to those of you who have served in that political arena. But doesn't this sound like a politician? The first group in Russia to learn that America was going to let the Soviet Union have a major role in building our new embassy, the Russian parliament. When they got word, four Russian parliamentarians resigned from office and started their own construction companies. <laughs> Politicians are the same the whole world over. <coughs> And we knew who these four corrupt politicians were that worked hand in glove with the KGB to compromise our embassy. And once they were identified, state tried to negotiate with the communist Soviet, or Soviet government, the Russian government, to turn these four crackers over to us to have them tried before an international tribunal. And they would not. Why? Because just like the CIA is part of the, our federal government, the KGB, they, as part of their government, would, they, the Soviet government would be admitting they're in collusion with this. Mm -hmm. So after two years, state decided to put together four covert teams. Each team had three members trained as an intelligent, hardcore intelligence operative to go into Russia each team was assigned one of those corrupt politicians to find them, monitor them, and at the right moment, invite them out of Russia. Invite. And if they weren't going to come, we're going to invite them a little harder. <laughs> and this cowboy from Bar River, Utah, I had the opportunity, which you 
read about in a train to Potemka, I had the opportunity to serve on one of those teams. And by the way, someone who approached me about talking about classified information, you will not hear classified information from me today. Uh, depending on how many Russian rubles you got, you could stay later and I'll tell you some <laughs> other stories. <laughs> but what an incredible experience that was. The man we were after, his name was Vladimir Koshka. He had left the Russian parliament and as I, he was corrupt, part of the Russian mafia. You've, you've all read about the Russian mafia. People ask me from time to time, are they like